Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. David Hodge from the National Center for Bioethics and Research at Healthcare Tuskegee University. We want to welcome you to our third day of public health ethics intensive at the great university. Um, today, we have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful conversation to be had, a much needed conversation on maternal mortality. We also have, after that presentation, another one on gun violence. So it is going to be very, 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 very thought-provoking and rich. But just take, let me take a moment and give you a kind of review over the last couple of, of days. Um, the first day, we had several several great speakers beginning with prof, um, Professor Dr. Vanessa Northerton Gamble, who was the past director for the National Center for Bioethics and Research and Healthcare at Tuskegee University. She's also part of the committee that brought about both the apology and the National Center to Tuskegee University. She, in her presentation, she had made some very important statements, including the import of making sure that we understand that medical ethics violations are not limited to the so-called Tuskegee syphilis study or the United States Public Health Service syphilis study at Tuskegee, but is a broader conversation that needs to be had about other kinds of medical health ethical violations that have been taking place among black and brown people in this country and worldwide. After her, we had the, the amazing presentation by Dr. Vicky Mays, who was also on the, um, the apology um, committee. And Dr. Wong, when I finish this part, please say something about the first day, the healing. <laughs> the healing day, uh, Dr. Dr. Safer, it would be very helpful, I think, for Dr. Shaw to see how that went. Um, and so Dr. Vicky Mays, she calls for a Belmont II. Understand that the Belmont Report or Belmont One was a was a was what came in response to the so-called CIFR study, United States Public Health Service CIFR study at Tuskegee, and the kind of thing that came out of it ethical and how the kind of things that we need to do to ensure that those things don't happen again. Well, that was a justice statement, and what Dr. Mays is calling for now is a social justice response. That is a proactive move to be more considerate and direct about particular things within particular silos, especially in the South, but throughout the country for black and brown people. So that Belmont too, if that is, if they pull that off, that would be amazing uh, restart to the conversation to make sure that cracks that have been just happening historically are no longer happening. Why we saw in the, at the pandemic over the last couple of years, that black and brown people were dying at a faster rate. Why do you call black and brown people? They so happened to have had the historical public health neglect, bioethical neglect, and undercurring comorbidities that would make them susceptible to the, the pandemic and the virus. So that's what Dr. Mintz called for. Then we had a, a, um, Ms. Lily Head, who is the president of the Voices for Our Father Legacy Committee um, and uh, uh, Foundation. And Ms. Head, as she has always done, gave us an amazing, amazing presentation about, and what she did was a narrative presentation. So she, she interviewed the, the, ch the, the children and grandchildren of men who were in the United States Public Health Service Simply Study at Tuskegee and got their responses and their feel that she told their stories. So we were all gripped by that very moving presentation by Ms. Head. She continues to lead in that, in that, that, that foundation and in her leadership, on her leadership, brought about the apology from Milbanks Foundation back in July and a, a nice sizable grant to help with the foundation forward in research and scholarships and various things around Tuskegee. Then we had her daughter, which was a unique blessing to have but her daughter, Carmen, Carmen Thornton, Carmen Head Thornton, who is a graduate of Howard University and a, uh, a MPH to give a visionary statement about what happens next. And that was very clear. She was very clear 
herself telling the stories. And one of the things that she said that was so important for us to be clear and to understand is that there's no need to pit tragedies against tragedies. So putting the Tuskegee, the so-called Tuskegee syphilis study against the Guatemala study, against the Holocaust, doesn't help anybody because what happened in Macon County, Alabama, is still very real and personal to the family, descendant family members who are living it and the community, especially those of us who continue to do the work each and every day. Then, uh, so yesterday, after those presentations that were so wonderful, yesterday we had Mr. Jesse Milan, who is the president of AIDS United, United a gentleman living with HIV for the last 40 years, he gave this most brilliant presentation about where we are right now with HIV and AIDS in America and how politicized the campaign against it has been or what we can do to eradicate this virus that has devastated so many, so many families. After that conversation, we then had um, Dr. Dr. Um, what's it, Dr. Crosby, Dr. Dominic Mack, a physician and professor and, and professor from Moha School of Religion about the coronavirus. Excuse me? Moha School of Medicine. What did I say? Moha School of Religion? <laughs> That's okay. I just told him myself. I just told myself. The Moha School of, of, uh, of Medicine. And thanks, Dr. Juan, the Moha School of Medicine, where he showed where, where he uh, talked about the 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 cop the, the first of all the grant that was given to Morehouse, but then the the relationship between Morehouse and Tuskegee University, particularly the National Center for Bioethics and Research and Healthcare, and our joint attempt to combat the COVID-19 disease, especially a conversation that needs to be had for black and brown people. He's responded and his put his his uh because we worked so close with him, Dr. Ruben Walwood was was also there to uh, open up and spoke to as a, as, as a responded to him about what the true, what the issues are and what we need to do to resolve them. Now, um, before we get into any further in, I want to introduce to you Dr. Ruben Warren, the director of the National Center of Bioethics, Bioethics and Research and Healthcare at Tuskegee University, and himself part of the, 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 um, the, the original conversation for the for the apology, and which happened 25 years ago, and himself has been in public service for 50 years as, as, uh, as uh, when he started his career in public health, as a public health service for the last 50 years, which means he's in public service for the last 50 years. And he is also, <laughs> not only the director and my mentor in this regard, I present to you Dr. Ruben Warren to say something about the healing day, the, the day of healing, because that is so important for what we are doing. Dr. Warren? Yes, good morning, and you all have gotten a really good overview of what we've been engaged in for the last, for this last several days. When we um, came together several years ago, um, became very clear that the family members, the descended family members, were, were, were carrying a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, and a lot of misinformation from the outside. And so we decided with, with, with their full support to host uh, a healing session, the first day of each commemoration. And in those, those healing sessions, we had a um, uh, clergy, a, a family that's in pastoral care and counseling and in Christian education to actually conduct that session, uh, Dr. Ann and Ed Wimberly. Uh, from the Interdenominational Theological Center. And it was for a closed session because it was the kind of engagement that it was very personal to the family members and they needed to have that kind of process uh, to really express their concerns, share their, their feelings from the time they were very young until today. Those sessions have been very, very inspirational for me and, and very educational. Out of that has come a time where... Um, it's the, the, the Senate family members have decided to, to open up that healing session to really, in fact, heal the nation. And that's what we've begun to do. This one was particularly important because Dr. Gene Sinkford, uh, former dean of the School of Dentistry at Howard University, was uh, the only uh, Black person, on, Black woman, on the uh, original Kennedy he uh, hearing session that actually talked about uh, what happened 
and made the recommendation to the federal government that the study should stop and that it was uh, unethical. And she had never had the opportunity to speak to the public. And we thought it was appropriate for her to speak to the family members before she spoke to anybody else. It was a very informative session and we all learned a lot. And that was the starting of our first day of healing. So now the healing <coughs> is not only with the descendant family members, but it's healing with the nation to really talk about not only the U.S. Public Health Service syphilis study at Tuskegee, but how that same kind of uh, violation has spread beyond before the so-called study and continues. And so we really begun to open up the nation to what we need to be doing to heal as a community. Thank you so much, Dr. Warren, for giving us that, that synopsis. Um, so today we bring you greetings from our president, Dr. Charlotte Morris, the, the second woman president at Tuskegee University for her sanctioning and her prayers and her blessings for us to continue to do this work. Um, we, um, the, on the first day, uh, Dr. Uh, S. Keith Hargill, our provost, um, spoke and represented her in that moment. We want to also thank a, a couple of people. One is Ms. Joe Valentine. Now uh, she's on right now. So, so Ms. Valentine, she is our hero. That's our colleague, our ally, our sister in the cause. She is at the CDC and she is the person who helps us to keep the relationship between the CDC and the National Center for Bioethics strong. So Dr. Va Ms. Valentine, thank you so very much. We want to also thank um, Brother Lachlan Furrow. Dr. Farrow is at, uh, retired from Beth Israel Hospital and a professor at Harvard and at the National, I mean, the Bioethics Center there at Harvard University, who, along with Dr. Kathleen McDuffie, who retired from the CDC, Dr. Riggins Earl, who's at the professor at the Interdenomination Theological Center in Atlanta, and Ms. Lily Head, who we joined together to start having conversations about what this this hour means. That is, we will never have this hour again. 90 years ago, in 1932, the United States Public Health Service began the syphilis study in Macon County, Alabama. 50 years ago, the United States Public Health Service, um, with pressure, brought the study to a close. So <laughs> it appears, but things continue to linger on. 25 years ago, a wonderful group of um, leaders went to President Bill Clinton and requested an apology from the United States and for, to the people of Macon County, the families of the men and the women, the men who were in the so-called syphilis study and their wives and families who continue to live with that legacy today. You know, I was thinking the other day when Ms. Uh, Ms. Carmen Norton Thornton Head was speaking, I remember the children of Dr. King, Dexter King particularly, he said something many years, about 25 years ago, he said, who among you would like to carry the legacy that we've been carrying? And that's what they've been doing. They've been carrying the legacy of what took place with their fathers and their family. So we want to thank all of those who have participated in bringing this together. We want to also thank um, Nurse Jackie uh, McCarroll and um, Dr. Cordelia Indu, who are our partners for CEUs. So all of you are on here now for your CEUs. We want to thank you for being here. We want to thank those who came together to help to make it happen. All right, no, no further ado, I want to introduce you to you, our, our <clears throat> Bioethics Honor student host today, Dr. Shaw. Every day, every session, we have a bioethics honor student who, who, who is a host. So that person introduces you and introduces the, the speakers as well as field the questions. Today we have Ms. Aria Aldridge. She's a world traveler, resilient, kind, and committed are some of the words that describe this native Atlantan. She's a, she is a mother of, <laughs> let me finish the sentence, she is a mother to her her baby, Felix, has self-proclaimed lifelong learning. Ari is a recent graduate of Maynard A. Jackson High School and Atlanta Metropolitan State College in Atlanta, Georgia. Here, she earned her associate degree as a dual enrollment student 
while attending high school. As well, Ari attends Tuskegee wow. University in Tuskegee, Alabama on a merit scholarship with a concentration in agribusiness. Having a spirited personality, Ari has always been known as a kind person. Growing up a Girl Scout, she learned the meaning of community service. Her dedication to the community has been exemplified through her many years of community service. While attending middle school, Ari was selected to participate in international community work with EF Tours. She spent time in local villages of the Dominican Republic and Peru. Her joy comes when giving back to her favorite organizations, that is the Women's Council of Empire Board of Realists, Precision Auxiliary Corps, and DeKalb Emory Hospital. As well, she has been, she has always demonstrated her enthusiasm for education. I was always looking for a lesson or takeaway from every situation she encounters. Ari has the ability to embrace delayed gratification. Growing up as an only child, she developed a strong mindset to have pride in the journey and work hard. Being raised by an entrepreneur, Ari became inspired to get a certification in lash extension installation. Next, she started her own business and became the founder and owner of R. Millen Lashes. In her spare time, I didn't know she had any, she works part time as a front desk consultant at more made hair and trainer with Lily Rose Petals. Ari enjoys traveling, feeding herself to spa, to spa days, spa days, and going to the gym. Ari represents the best of our bioethics honor students. And so now we present to you Ms. Aria Aldridge, and she will introduce our presenter for today. Ms. Aldridge, take it away. Thank you so much for that warm introduction, Dr. Hyde. It is an absolute pleasure to be here this afternoon and to be presenting our dynamic panelist, Dr. Neil Shaw. Dr. Neil Shaw is Chief Medical Officer of Maven Clinic, the world's largest clinic for women in family health, and Assistant Professor of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Biology at Harvard Medical School. He is a globally recognized expert in designing solutions that improve healthcare and is listed among the 40 smartest people in healthcare by the Becker's Hospital Review. Dr. Shaw's work to build equitable, trustworthy systems of care has been profiled by the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Good Morning America, and other outlets. He is featured in the film's Aftershock, which won the special jury prize for impact at the 2022 Sundance Film Festival and The Color of Care, released in 2022 by the executive producer Oprah Winfrey on the Smithsonian Channel. Dr. Shaw has written landmark academic papers and contributed to four books, including as senior author of Understanding Value-Based Healthcare, McGraw-Hill, which Don Berwick has called an instant classic, and Atul Gawande, called A Masterful Primer for All Clinicians. Prior to joining the Harvard facility, Dr. Shaw founded Cost of Care, an NGO that curates insights in clinicians and patients to help delivery systems provide better care. In 2017, he co-founded the March for Moms Association, a coalition of more than 20 leading organizations to increase public and private investment in the well-being of mothers. Dr. Shaw serves on the advisory board of the National Institutes of Health, Office of Women's Health Research. Please welcome me and please join me in welcoming Dr. Shaw. Take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Aria. Um, and congratulations on all of your accomplishments. Um, and uh, thank you, Dr. Hodge and Dr. Warren. Um, and all of you who are uh, participating in this webinar, it's really an honor to share space with all of you, um, both because of this very important topic and of course, because of the history uh, that uh, warrants coming together to talk about ethics and public health and how they coincide. Um, I was told to talk about the ethics of maternal mortality, and um, I'm going to do that. I'm going to frame it a little bit differently, though, if that's okay. Um, let me see if I can get this. We're like three years into living in Zoom, and we're just, I'm still struggling with it. I don't know about you guys. Um, can everybody see this? Yes. Okay. 
I think that the existential crisis for the entire healthcare system is trustworthiness. As uh, healthcare providers, as public health institutions, as really anybody who's in the business of serving people who are in need of healthcare services, you know, it's not the job of the people that we serve to be more trusting, it's our job to be more trustworthy. But the challenge is that in 2022, we have to be able to look at this as more than a virtue because otherwise trustworthiness is just a litmus test that we apply to each other. This is what I think, by the way, this is, this is not like evidence-based or data-backed. This is, this is my perspective that I'm, I'm concerned uh, about, you know, in the effort to drive um, progress and equity in our healthcare system, uh, There's a floor, and of course, there needs to be um, alignment in values, vision, mission, and there has to be morality, but I don't, I, I'm concerned about moral litmus tests being part of this. So the, the, so the idea is that how can we make trustworthiness not just a virtue, but an output of a system that's either working or not working for people? That's what I want to talk about. Um, and. I want to frame it in terms of childbirth, uh, which is central to the question of maternal mortality because, well, first of all, we're all born. Um, so I think as an event or a milestone in our lives collectively, it's a little bit different from the rest of healthcare. It's one of life's only two certainties. There's the beginning and the end. That's about all we know for sure, right? And and it's it's part of a process that can have pathology and can have risk, of course, like the rest of life, but it's also a process that's quote unquote natural. And I think that makes that a little bit exceptional. Also, uh, the well-being of mothers is a bellwether for the well-being of society as a whole. So I understand like that, I think you said, um, Dr. Hodge, that the next uh, talk is on gun violence. And um, these things are related. I think that you know, if if moms are unwell, society is unwell, which is why every injustice in our society shows up in the well-being of moms, whether it's racial inequity, gender inequity, geographic inequity. When we think about disparities in care across Alabama or across the country in general, rural versus urban, urban underserved areas, the fact that your zip code has such a big impact on your proximity to opportunity. Um, and then, um, somewhat controversially, I would say, um, generational equity too. Whether it's make America great again or build back better, across the entire political spectrum right now, there is a sense that hope and opportunity in our country is eroding. And, you know, there's a couple leading indicators. One of them is the fact that an American today is 50% more likely to die in childbirth than her own mother not as a statistical aberration, but as a 25-year trend line. Continuously, maternal mortality is getting worse. And there is no way to understand that without recognizing that the difference between the best-off person in America and the worst-off person in America has gotten wider. Right In public health, sometimes we can kid ourselves because public health is based on epidemiology and epidemiology is based on measures of central tendency. It's a little bit wonky, but this is a public health audience, right? Like we look at what happens to populations on average and we can make things look better on average and leave certain people further behind. But in actually in maternal health and with the maternal mortality crisis in particular, people who are best off, they're still fine, but we've left some people so far behind that actually on average maternal mortality is getting worse. So if you're black in America, you're three to four times more likely to die. Um, I'm gonna take you through like a quick journey of how I've been thinking about this problem of trustworthiness. And by the way, I'm not an expert in this at all, I'm struggling with it. But I think that's actually part of, part of why it's important to talk about. But I've now worked um, in my career in government, in the public sector, in academia, and as I'll tell you, uh, the last year and a half in, in the private sector, uh, 
all from different positions, but with a very consistent mission statement and vision for a world in which every person can choose to grow their family with dignity. And I like that framing for the problem that needs to be solved because of the fact that it increases the aperture, right? Because, you know, survival is the floor for childbirth, right? But people have goals other than emerging unscathed from the process. If we're trying to design a better system, we need to aim for the ceiling, which I think is dignity. Um, I think if we're trying to operationalize trustworthiness, we need at least three things. We have to be competent in taking good care of people. We're not doing that today. That's all the statistics that I just laid out for you. It's also not sufficient to be competent. I think one of the things we saw during co the COVID-19 pandemic, especially during the heights of it in 2020, was it took every inequity in our society and threw it into a pressure cooker. And um, one of the things that really eroded trust in the system was our inconsistency in how we have deployed the resources of our system to help different people. And the reliability of the system to show up when people expected them to and in the ways that they expected them to. So you've got to be competent. You got to be consistent in saying, meaning what you say and saying what you mean. And you have to um, affirm people at the end of the day. I think, you know, do no harm is often interpreted as, uh, you know, safety at all costs. Sometimes at the expense of people's experience. That's the paradigm, right? Like, safety is the primary objective. Experience is a secondary luxury. But everything we're learning about the maternal mortality crisis, particularly when it comes to how it impacts Black people, is that we have that whole thing backwards. Attending to people's lived experience is how you make them safe. Because time and time again, what's going on is that people aren't being seen and heard. Um, so uh, it's 2022. It's almost 2023. Uh, rewind the tapes about 10 years ago. I had just finished my clinical training. Um, in Boston. I'd never seen what it looked like to give birth in, in America outside of Boston. Um, and, you know, I just finished residency. I thought I was a pretty good doctor. Um, and uh, I got my first job at a school of public health of all places. And the macro statistics on how childbirth worked in America and my own self-perception were not matching. It's like, if you're a clinician in the trenches, your job is to think about the variation around the mean. But if you're a public health prof professional, you're trying to think about central tendency of the whole population. Basically what this comes down to is, I found out like early on that not only is maternal mortality going up, but it's not for lack of like doing things to people clinically. In fact, it's the opposite. So from the early 1970s until now, basically a generation or two, the C-section rate in the United States has gone up by 500%. Like, is it because we're sicker? No, not exactly. There, there's no healthcare service that's skyrocketed by 500%. And this is a surgery that's designed to rescue. But term infants are 0% better off over that period, and moms are more likely to die. It's a pretty damning set of statistics. And I was like, how is it that we're doing that much surgery because certainly like when I do a C-section or anybody around me does a C-section, we're always right. Because if the baby comes out looking perfect and healthy, we think it's a good thing I did a C-section. And if the baby comes out, you know, blue and lackluster with low APGAR scores, we think that was a sick baby. It's a good thing I did a C-section. So either way, I'm right. It's pretty good to be me, right? And so you can convince yourself that you're always doing the right thing, but we can't all be doing the right thing because something's up with us. This is pretty, pretty wild, right? So in 2013, I'd, I'd never seen what it looked like to give birth outside of Boston. And uh, Atul Gawande was my mentor, who uh, um, is a surgeon at my hospital, but also was a journalist uh, at the time and uh, had a journalist instincts. Because it turns out there also wasn't a lot of data on childbirth in 2013. Medicare doesn't pay for childbirth. Medicaid does. And there's 50 Medicaid systems. So like you couldn't, there was no like big database to go to. There were like birth certificates, but birth certificates weren't filled out accurately. It's like, how do I chase this problem? And he was like, just go see what it looks like to give birth in America. So that's what I did. I had a whole year of my life to go um, to critical access hospitals, um, to other 
uh, big medical centers to birthing centers uh, all across the country. And um, one of the things that we saw was that C-sections weren't driven by the decision to do a C-section. They were driven by the way people were cared for during labor. And that has everything to do with how they're supported. And that has everything to do with combination of resources and how human beings tend to discriminate in how they deploy their time, attention, and effort, and to whom. Um, came back from those travels with this cartoon, which we call their pressure tank model. But basically, on the labor floor and in life, we often face a dichotomous choice between doing the right thing and doing the easy thing. In fact, my litmus test for character has been picking the right thing over the easy thing ever since I learned this. But on the labor and delivery unit, you can either persist in supporting someone in labor for a very long time in the face of ambiguous information, or you can just be done and do a C-section. And the most common reasons to do C-sections are for ambiguous reasons. Feel heart tracings that don't necessarily give you accurate information, or labors are taking too long that require you to put in more effort. So it's always easier to do a C-section. And there are a bunch of things in the environment of the hospital that influence the pressure in the system. Some of which might be obvious, but some of which were like a little mind blowing. So we found out that there are no rules for the amount of labor and delivery rooms that you need based on the people that you take, the number of people you take care of. So like, for example, we went out to two hospitals on the West Coast. Both of them had the same number of rooms for women to give birth but one hospital did twice as many deliveries per year as the other. And they both thought they were at their capacity limit, which means both hospitals didn't think that they had room for a single more baby, but one place was doing twice as many deliveries. The only way that's possible, according to Isaac Newton, is if one place is moving people through the labor floor way faster, right? The only way to do that is to do more C-sections. So then we figured out that every labor and delivery unit in America has a fire escape map in it. Uh, by public mandate as like a, you know, and that's a floor plan. And you can look at it and it'll tell you how many labor and delivery rooms there are. And we had people across the country take pictures with their phones of the fire escape map and send it to us. And it turned out we could predict the C-section rate off their fire escape map. Um, and then we set out to prove that there was something to this pressure hypothesis with more Precision. So what we did is we went to the city of Philadelphia, where it's an old city and they have old city records. And uh, it turns out in the 90s, half of the labor and delivery units closed for a variety of reasons, but the size of the population didn't change. And what that meant was the remaining units got way busier. And so that created a natural experiment where there was more pressure in the system and we could look at what happened. And basically what these graphs show this is the only graph I have in this whole talk, but the y-axis is how many people are in labor at the same time on any given, at any given hospital, and the y-axis is an odds ratio. And what it shows is the busier the hospital is, the more likely it is that the clinicians will do things to speed up the process. That's what the top panel shows. And the bottom panel shows that the busier the hospital is, the more likely it is that people are going to get hurt. Whether it's a you know, you see that in different signals, an infection, a hemorrhage, things like that. Uh, so that begs the question, what do you do about that? And um, we didn't know, <laughs> but we started with like two principles. One is in this pressure tank environment, which by the way, like think about this for a second. All of your grandparents were probably born at home. And in their day, most people died at home. We've institutionalized birth and death fairly recently. And in those institutions, in some ways we've made things better, but in other ways we haven't. Interestingly, like, you know, a living will and a birth plan are the same thing. Only one is recognized and the other doesn't really get systematically recognized. Consider this, the definition of an ICU is not the presence of a ventilator. It's the ability to staff one nurse to one patient. That's the definition of an ICU. The cardiac ICU of the hospital staffs one nurse to one patient. So does the labor floor. 
the cardiac ICU has telemetry, meaning the ability to look at all these heart tracings. So does the labor floor. The only difference between the labor floor and the cardiac ICU is that on the labor floor, the operating rooms are attached, which means it's the most intense treatment environment of the entire hospital for the healthiest people. And then like, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what's happening, right? You take 99% of American women, you put them in ICUs, you surround them by surgeons, and then you see a ton of surgery. And a lot of it's not helping people. And some of it's harming people. Remember, you can hurt people in two ways in healthcare. You can hurt them when you do too little too late, and you can hurt them when you do too much too soon. Um, but anyway, if you're gonna fix this problem, you gotta figure out how to make the right thing to do the easier thing to do. It's not fair to the doctors and nurses and midwives and doulas to give them another thing to do on top of a really hard job. You also have to realize that like, you know, unless there's a full moon, you have no idea how many people are gonna go into labor that day or what's gonna happen. Who's gonna need the blood bank? Who's gonna need the operating room? So you've gotta figure out how to make decisions under uncertainty, ideally with good teamwork. Turns out like 80 to 90% of all adverse events things that go wrong in the hospital are due to failures of communication and teamwork. It's probably not surprising. But what is interesting about that is when people are chasing this maternal mortality problem forever, they've been looking at death certificates to explain it. And the number one cause of maternal mortality according to a death certificate is that your heart stops. But I'm pretty sure that everybody who dies, their heart stops. So I'm not, I'm not sure what that tells us. The other thing, the number two cause is hemorrhage. And I can tell you from being in the hospital and taking care of very sick people and being in the trenches that I have seen people survive severe hemorrhages and not survive much more moderate ones. The difference, always communication and teamwork. People in America are not dying of hemorrhage, they're dying of failures of communication and teamwork. And then you take a gender equity lens, a racial equity lens, an intersectional lens, Right, the most vulnerable person in America is almost certainly a pregnant woman of color, you know, in the South. You imagine her giving birth, and you can, and then, and you're like, well, if, if communication and teamwork is what saves lives, and some people are being treated differently than others, that's that's a problem. So we 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 didn't know what to do, but we this is now like 2016, 2017, 2016. We 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 brought together a group of uh, physicians, nurses, midwives scientists, implementation scientists, health services researchers. And we tried to design a solution and uh, with intention, because a lot of times in healthcare, we just throw spaghetti against the wall. We wanted to like, you know, design something. And we didn't know what it was gonna become, but we wanted it to be something that could work in all settings. Um, in rural Alabama and uh, on the upper side in, in New York City. We wanted something that could work in Tanzania and Malawi and Seattle. And so we came up with something that was very analog, which is this. It turns out that in every labor and delivery room in America, there's a dry erase whiteboard, most inpatient rooms. And sometimes they're not filled out, sometimes they are. They're mostly for nurses to talk to themselves, but they exist. So we took them and we, we made them bigger we position them so that everyone in the room, especially the woman in labor can see them. And then we structure them. And what that does is it creates all the tenants of a good team. Because if you think about it, like the people in the hospital don't know who's gonna go in, into labor that day. And the people that go into labor don't know who's gonna be in the hospital. So they have to become instantly a high performing team from one of the most important moments of our lives. It's pretty hard. And to be a good team, they have to have role clarity they have to have structured communication so they can expect what should be communicated. And they have to have psycho psychological safety, which means they have to have permission and opportunity to speak. So we made a board, we positioned it so everyone can see it, and we use it to structure communication. There's only four pieces of it. There's one place where you write down every member of the team, starting with the mom herself. That's not just that no, people know each other's names, but it's to create role clarity and it's to create permission for people to speak and opportunity. There's a place to write down the things that only the mom can tell you, which include like preferences and symptoms, but there's also things that aren't preferences or symptoms, like how much energy you have to push. That's not a symptom. That's just like something that only a person in labor can tell you. 
And at 3 a.m., that's hugely relevant if someone's been pushing for two or three hours. There's no technology that will tell you if the baby's going to come out. Um, there's a place where you write down, you know, the plan. And then there's a the part where you write down the next time the team is going to get back together again and talk. Um, and that's so that moms in labor don't feel like I felt last night, which is a passenger on the plane that's being held on the tarmac without anybody telling you what's going on, what's going to happen next. And it turns out that that step goes a long way towards aligning the team. Because um, again, it's not the decision to do a C-section that drives them. It's uh, the lack of alignment of the team way upstream. So we tested this. Um, idea of having structured communication, but using a whiteboard to do it. We ran a registered clinical trial, a national trial. It was really complicated. It was only at four community hospitals. Uh, we didn't want to do it in academic centers. We wanted to do it in places where uh, that resembled hospitals where most Americans are born, but um, involved uh, thousands of families uh, involved tens of thousands of families, thousands of clinicians that were on both coasts and in the heartland. And what we found was this. As a result of doing this, people felt like they had the role in their care that they wanted, that they understood what was happening to them and that their preferences made a difference. That was kind of cool, but what was particularly cool in the trial is that we showed a dose response. So the more structured communication huddles that happened in front of this board, the more likely it was that people believed these things. That was cool. And then we surveyed clinicians and we found that um, they felt that it improved their decision making. Um, I told you when I do a C-section, I'm always right. So the fact that the clinicians felt like it helped them was, was a win. Um, and it wasn't all cotton candy and rainbows. Like when you're trying to do change management in the hospital, there's a lot of canvassing and there's always people that don't like it. But over time, we were able to get to these out outcomes. And we weren't powered to show uh, statistically that we were improving um, other clinical outcomes. We did see declines in cesarean rates. We saw declines in unexpected newborn complications. We saw declines in severe maternal morbidity. And that was encouraging enough to do what we did next. Um, one was we've started to scale it up. Uh, so. Um, I think there are a number of states across the country now that are that are doing this, Oklahoma, New Jersey, um, Massachusetts, um, and a few other others. Um, but what we did in tandem to trying to scale it up was to try to prove that it could work to address gaps in racial equity specifically in one of the hardest places in the country. We went to Tulsa. Um, I wish I could see all your faces, but like, you know, I don't know how many of you saw this movie. I know, I know that, um, probably for a lot of you, it's like triggering, even like the trailer, but it, but it, it's like, what we wanted to do was document the messiness of trying. And we went to Tulsa, um, a year before the centennial of the 1921 race massacre. And honestly, like, you know, I'll be honest with you. So I, um, my parents grew up in a colony. Uh, their grandparents, my grandparents were involved in like decolonizing their country. So I, I grew up with a, a strong understanding of like colonialism and colorism and thought I had an idea of, of how racism worked. A lot of my family lives in Jackson Heights in Queens. And uh, for those of you who read the New York Times in March, 2020, the Elmhurst Hospital in Queens, where my family is from, was like, you know, it was at the epicenter of the whole global pandemic. I thought I had a good idea of how systemic and structural racism works. I didn't feel it in my bones until I went to Tulsa, where, you know, there's a whole neighborhood that was like burned to the ground, literally, a hundred years ago. And like, of course, like there are all these sordid episodes of racial violence in our history. But you could see how it propagates forward because it's still the community that has the lowest educational attainment and worst healthcare outcomes. Oklahoma is like fifth from the bottom for maternal mortality. And these were the hospitals that had the worst maternal mortality rates. So we decided we were going to bring this project there. 
and we, um, you know, change management isn't a way to win popularity contests <laughs> necessarily. You know, they're all the dynamics that you could imagine. Um, we there was a, a community-based organization, the Tulsa Birth Equity Initiative, that were our partners in it, and then we we decided we were going to document the whole thing, um, which is unusual because typically from an academic position, like you, you know, you don't show people results until after you publish a paper, right? You don't usually document the sausage making, but we but we did, and it became this movie aftershock, and the movie is not about. Uh, entirely that that work in Tulsa. It, it centers two families who um, experienced maternal mortality, and it and it actually really focuses on um, everything that happened to them afterwards, um, and how they organized their communities to hold hospitals accountable. And and uh, that was what we we're aiming to do in Tulsa. And actually, it's been it's been a couple years since, and and it looks like it's working. Um, and actually, what 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 I, what I think is happening right now is that the birth equity movement in our country is sort of where the HIV AIDS movement was in the late 1980s. You know, I do see some gray hairs here. So I think there's probably folks that like remember that, but you know, it, it was um, basically a group of pe the pe people who were the most impacted by HIV AIDS were the ones that were also marginalized by society and disenfranchised. And so the Reagan administration didn't seem to care. <laughs> Pharmaceutical companies didn't seem to care. And then there were community organizations that organized and created ACT UP and organizations like that. And they, they, they held the health system to account. They got AZT passed. They dropped mortality by 70%. They made it so that you can't do HIV AIDS research without a community advisory board. And they created community accountability health system and I, I see things going in that direction um all right it's a little bit of a mixtape but it, it follows my trajectory so like right before before the, the film came out I actually um I, I I I partially out of an awareness of how controversial the film was going to be um uh but I um sort of step, stepped into a new role. I gave my grants away. Um, other people are sort of carrying that work forward. And I took a leave from the university because maternal mortality is a bigger problem than what's happening in our hospitals. Um, maternal mortality is driven by gaps in what people have access to outside of the hospital, in the communities where they live most of their lives. There's only so much you can do in a punctuated 15 minute office visit or even a couple day hospital stay. And I was intrigued by the fact that people were spending billions of dollars uh, on trying to provide access to support and services virtually because of the fact that I was seeing the way that where you live was such a determinant of what you had access to. And I wanted to break that paradigm and I was getting impatient. So, I had an opportunity to join Matron Clinic with which, you know, Aria mentioned as part of my, my bio. It's the largest digital clinic in the, in the world now. Um, we take care of 15 million people in 175 countries. And the idea is like, you know, like an app isn't going to fix healthcare. An app isn't going to address structural racism. But, but the idea is that most people carry this around in their pocket. And the reason is it's a portal into other things, information, and other human beings, right? It should be a portal into another human service. And so I've been spending the last year and a half uh, trying to figure out how to build trustworthiness in the system in one of the most <laughs> unlikely places, which is through a venture-backed digital health company. But it, it, it's based on this premise that like what people need is trustworthy primary care, which is not a type of doctor, it's a set of capabilities that don't exist in the brick and mortar world. It's the ability to have a first point of contact with someone who can actually help you. It's the ability to treat them as more than a uterus. It's the ability to be able to coordinate across our fragmented system, and it's the ability to stick with them uh, over the course of a journey. And I saw the ability to do that if I could just live in my patient's pockets, in their, in their phones. And so when I go back to those tenets of trustworthiness, what I saw was the ability to be not just competent, but reliable. 
right? Like during the pandemic, a lot of prenatal care got shut down and it went virtual. And things that people needed access to, they had to wait weeks for. And part of what was interesting to me is like, if you live in the Delta of Arkansas, there's nobody around who's like a nutritionist to help you with your gestational diabetes that's close by. But can I connect you with someone who can look through your phone and help you, you know, at your refrigerator and help you plan a meal? Or if you're struggling to breastfeed, can I connect you to a lactation consultant at 3 a.m., right, when you actually need one? So those are some of the capabilities. Um, and interestingly, the other thing that you can do in this space is, um, you know, again, like if you live in the Delta of Arkansas and you're pregnant, probably none of the providers are going to look like you. Um, and what's interesting is we're able to match people because we don't have to worry about geography to um, providers that share their lived experience, whether it's based on language, based on race, based on religion. And when people have that option, uh, more than 80% of people match into care on that basis. And you can't deliver a baby through a screen. You can't replace brick and mortar services, but you can move the needle by nudging people towards evidence-based decisions and supporting healthy behavior because behavior change is hard. But we're able to improve C-section rates by finding people who got a C-section the first time, think they need one the second time, when maybe there's an opportunity not to, and educating them at the right moment. Um, only about 5% of people in the United States who are pregnant get to see a mental health care doctor. Um, and about 30% of people across you know, our sort of digital platform are getting benefit from those kinds of services <clears throat> when, when we target target that way. So it's not meant to be an advertisement for Maven Clinic. It's just meant to say part of my optimism about where things are going in building more trustworthy system, like we have to, we have to disrupt what exists. And that that's going to require incremental improvements to what's happening in the four walls of the hospital. It's also going to require like thinking fundamentally differently about how people access services. And it's not normative to use your phone to talk to a doctor outside of San Francisco, but I think in the next five years, it will be. Um, the last thing I want to say, <clears throat> just in the spirit of optimism, um, well, I mean, so this is an issue that's gotten a lot of public attention. Maternal mortality is something that um, is not just being talked about in conferences like this, but is being platformed by the White House now. There's a lot of federal legislation going towards it. Maybe what I'll say is, um, I'm going to quote uh, Loretta Ross, who um, uh, I think is like in her mid-70s now, um, but she's a reproductive justice icon who um, actually coined the term reproductive justice and wrote the book. And I was, I was talking to her two weeks ago about um, the arc of her career and how she maintains optimism. Because she was around for the original Roe decision, and she was around for the Dobbs decision. And what she said is um, that none of us should imagine ourselves as the entire chain of freedom, that we're not responsible for what our ancestors did or what our descendants will do, but um, you know, our job is to make sure that the chain doesn't break at our link. And she said something to me that I thought was really profound, which is like, when the world's a mess, like your job is to grab a broom and clean where you are. So anyway, that's what I have to say. Um, Dr. Hodge, you said to keep it flowing. So I don't know if I did that, but I'm, I'm happy to have a conversation. Thank you so much, Dr. Starr. And uh, as, I, as I beg everyone on the screen, I can see them more clearly. Um, that was extremely insightful. Okay, I can see better. I, I saw where there's a whole lot of um, or there's several oranges in the uh, <laughs> in the field. So I expect Aria that, that that some of them may be the relations. So feel free to introduce them to us when you are when, when, when I turn it back over to you. Uh, Dr. Shaw, this thing is 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 really compelling. Um, as uh, as as close as I am to Dr. William Warren, Dr. Reagan Zero, what they may not know is that um, my son David was born in St. Francis Hospital in Tulsa. No for way. Hospital, yeah, for all the hospital for you to choose, you chose that one. <laughs> 
And on top of that, he was born as a premature, premature at three pounds, eight ounces. He is now six one and about 180 pounds. And, uh, and it was a C-section because his mother was in distress. So you said it was a rescue mission. So I think that fully correlated to the, the best of what C-section was supposed to do, supposed to do. Um, he was in the, what's called the Eastern Oklahoma Neonatal Center, which was a fantastic place. I, it was amazing. And as you said, it's like one nurse per child. And uh, if a child is in distress, then there were about five or six, they shut the hospital, they shut the whole center down and they'll focus on that one child. And so it was an amazing thing to see. Some of them didn't make it out of there, but um, the parents, that's why I started giving to Ronald McDonald House because they were such a major supporter. Okay, um, um, Tulsa, thing with Tulsa. Tulsa is, um, I'm, I'm glad that you used there. Tulsa, uh, Dr. Lachlan Poro, I don't think he's on right now, but he, he tells the story about the increased teenage pregnancies and infant mortality. So I would like for you to say something about infant mortality if you can. Um, by the way, I have sitting at my right hand wow. <laughs> this, this particular work. Okay. Um, so doctor, um, so infant mortality and the numbers were increasing. Um, in Tulsa, Oklahoma City. So they did a, a moral education, Dr. Earl, they did a moral education training. Um, this was a few years ago. And, and I, when I was living in Tulsa, going to Oral Roberts, Uni Oral Roberts University, living there, um, I was acquainted with the high infant mortality rate, just like we're acquainted now with the high maternal mortality rate in Alabama. I was acquainted with that in Tulsa. But Based upon education, they were able to, the numbers started declining in Tulsa at a faster rate at, 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 than they were um, declining in, in um, Oklahoma City and other places. The question is for you, what, one of the questions as other people, please start posting your questions in the question and answer, and Ms. Alridge is gonna, is gonna start reading them to you. So the question I have is, um, going, moving forward, and you gave some amazing numbers. I think it's a 500% increase in cesareans, cesareans. That is amazing, appalling, amazing. But as we move forward, what kind of moral education can we at the National Center for Bioethics and Research and Healthcare, what can we do to give positive impact to, if it's 500% increase, that's a crisis. What can we do to give positive impact to conversations to ensure that um, that the best healthcare outcomes are being provided to those black and brown people who you mentioned? Um, I have deep affection for St. Francis Hospital. Spent many, many time, many a lot of time there over the years, um, and the whole city of Tulsa. So it's it's. Uh, Nice to hear about that shared connection, and I'm, I'm I'm glad that your son ended up growing quite a bit from from three pounds to 180. That's uh, that's a lot. <laughs> um, uh, and thank you for having my book. It's you and my mom that I think have read it. So, um, I I would say like you know the I like the or I like the way that you asked what can you at the center do because um, I, I mean look like with with any big intractable problem. Part of what I think is important to realize is positionality and that we all have different roles to play in it. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's going to take um, a, a number of responses and we don't all have to do it the same way. Um, but we have to do it in our best way from an understanding of our position. So like in the private sector, the way I solve problems is very different from the way I did as an academic or the way I did in government. But it's, I really, I, I moved to the private sector because I was like, corporate America needs to get their shit together. I mean, like we, we all have to play our, sorry. Um, it's okay. And, and, Do we know, understand? Yeah, so like the, the center, I think that I imagine, this is the case, that you are a trustworthy 
source of information for Black people in your community in Alabama and the country at large. That if you say something, it is probably the case that you are a trustworthy messenger in a time where there are very few, like the CDC isn't a trustworthy mes messenger right now, in my opinion. Not that they're wrong, I believe in science, but from a messaging standpoint, the American public is confused because going back to those three pillars, they're inconsistent. We don't have to diagnose it, it's complicated. But I would imagine that you are a trustworthy messenger. And so I think that's a really, really important role. Um, in 2022, I don't think the dominant cause of suffering in the world is lack of knowledge. I think it's lack of execution on the knowledge that we have, right? And so th that translation, I think, is really everything. It's figuring out, um, you know, anyway, I, I guess, Without, without trying to answer the question too tactically, what I, what I just want to amplify is do not discount or in any way undervalue how important that is, um, that you are a objective source of information. You don't have a business incentive. Your only incentive is the truth. That is a rare and valuable thing. And uh, for the community that most needs support, it's not that it's not that people are uneducated, right? Like even in, in Tulsa, like the infant mortality rate, I don't know the specific history, but it's probably largely driven by racial inequity. Because if you're black, you're twice as likely to experience infant mortality. And so it's not that people are undereducated, it's that they're under-resourced. And the, the, often the gap in education is, you know, what they need to do to access the resources that they rightfully should be able to, to get. Um, Interestingly, also, infant mortality is most insensitive, most sensitive to injustice, I think. Um, you know, in every humanitarian disaster, maternal and infant health suffers disproportionately, but you see it in prematurity and infant mortality rates, whether it's a war like Russia's invasion of the Ukraine, a natural disaster like the hurricane in Florida, uh, or um, a pandemic like we just went through. So, I don't know, that was a rambling answer, but that's... Well, well, you know, I want to I want to build upon something you said that's so major to um, this, and that is our identity at the National Center, National Bioethics Center. Um, I, I want everyone to know who's listening that this is my first day speaking to Dr. Neil Shaw. We've never met before. I know the Dr. Warren has never met him before, right? Okay. Um, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. Dr. Warren, Dr. Bob True, Dr. Lachlan Farrell, and myself published a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine entitled Trustworthiness Before Trust. No way. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> yes. And, uh, and a, 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 um, about 40 hours later, we heard Dr. Fauci using the language of trustworthiness before trust and, and, and actually pointing to that, that article. And it's and the, the, the important part of that, um, Dr. Warren was the the driver on the notion of we have to be trustworthy. It has trustworthiness must be speak to trust. My my job as an ethicist was to was to kind of tease that out. What does trustworthiness mean versus trust? Um, trusting, I defend, is a kind of instinctive. Um, less value-based, more human, not just even human, just species-based. Because, I mean, a baby trusts that there's some food in his or her mother's nipple, right? And he, he, the baby does not say, I trust that there's food there. It's instinctively making that response, and it comes back and again and again, such that the mother continues to provide food. Then that's a metaphor for what trustworthiness would be and is. I've always used the language of the work I do is in support and defense of a 13 year old um, girl in Kenya whom I do not know. And people ask, well, who's, who is she? I don't know her, right? It's a metaphor for some child somewhere. It could be a 13 year old girl in Ukraine. And as you just said, a 13 year old girl in Puerto Rico or a 13 year old girl in wherever the hurricane hits next, a 13 year old child somewhere that we're doing this work for because if we continue to do it and do it with, with fervor and passion and resilience, what happens is 
we develop that what you just call the notion of trustworthiness. So trustworthiness then is a moral value. Trusting is not. If it be, the person who is trustworthy builds himself or herself up in such a way that the person who is vulnerable, therefore susceptible and, and um, to whatever experiences they may have, their vulnerability needs a trustworthy partnership or exploitation is so possible. Now, having said that, speaking to, to trust, trust, trustworthiness, I love your terms on competence, consistency, and connection. Please tell me, I think there's some other key terms um, in trustworthiness of like reliability and, and promise keeping. You may have been trying to stay with the C's for alliteration, and I know it's way more powerful than that, but it's, <laughs> but it's helpful to remember. But, um, but I think reliability is a part of the whole trustworthy network and the ability to keep promises is a part of that. So question for you. And then we'll, after I finish, then you will go, then um, Ms. Aldridge is gonna start asking you questions from our question and answer. Um, um, you just mentioned that the CDC, based upon some events recently, is not necessarily the most trustworthy place to go, or it's a scientific place to go. Um, where, beyond the National Bioethics Center, in terms of maternal mortality, if we're talking to mothers or now, or, or pregnant women now, where is a reliable place for them to go if they have questions, if they have concerns? if they need some things addressed, where's a reliable place that they can go, a place where they could be in communication. In, I've always said that probably one of the problems with informed consent is that sometimes PhDs don't know what they're talking about. So where can they go where there's a language that they can understand to help them to understand um, C-section <laughs> versus natural birth and what's in their best interest over against just trusting a system that has not proven itself to be trustworthy. Where can they go? Is there a place that they can go? Well, first of all, I just pulled up the New England Journal paper um, uh, and clearly it influenced Dr. Fauci and it clearly in influenced me too. So uh, thank you for that paper, Dr. Warren and Dr. Hodge. And I saw you work with La Lachlan Farrow as well, who, um, uh, uh, I know so many full circle things, and I, I can't believe you know. I guess it was sort of destined that we are, are paths would cross, but mm -hmm. I mean, I, I guess uh, to your question, um, there isn't one. That's the problem, mm -hmm. right? But then, what? So we have to do is like figure out what constitutes trustworthiness, and then try to um, install those attributes um, in in our institutions broadly. But I, I but I do think that. At least, like the way that I, <laughs> I think about it, um, at Maven is that you know, we earn the opportunity to make people healthy by engaging them in the right way, and to engage them in the right way, they have to be trustworthy. They, I mean, we have to be trustworthy, right? So, um, I think it starts with things like having common ground, and you can't paint any group of people as a monolith. Um, so like, even like we have this ability to match people to providers based on identity. And I also completely realize that like, that's not the only thing you care about, like, you know, like, but it's like, it, it is a starting point. So I think, I think that really helps. And then I think you're right. Like you have to, at the end of the day, mean what you say and say what you mean. And that's been the challenge with a lot of our public health messaging. It's not that, uh, you know, it's, it's okay for messages to change, you know, it's okay. Uh, they have to, that's science as you learn. That's not the problem. The problem is that there's been a sense that uh, the decision-making principles underneath that have not been consistent, that uh, you know, people are trying to optimize for, for different things along the way, right? Whether it's an election cycle or uh, you know, um, public health utility or whatever the case might be, so. Well, thank you very much for that. And uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Aria Aldridge. Uh, but one thing I want to keep in, in your mind is that yesterday when, when Mr. Jesse Martin spoke and he talked about the politicization and the criminalization of HIV and AIDS. And when Vicky Mays, Dr. Vicky Mays spoke, he talked about 
the problem of data. So when you mentioned data just now, it is if we're going to be trustworthy, we have to, um, those of us at the National Center, for example, we have to have trustworthy information, but the politicization of data makes it so difficult to have that kind of trustworthy information so that we could. Well, yeah, um, I mean, well, that's the thing. Like, I feel like there's a missing skill set in our public health institutions where, like, what science gets you, like, you, I, I believe that you can't fix what you don't see and you can't see what you don't measure, right? Like, you, like that's the purpose of data. But what data does is it, it gives you confidence that what you think you're observing is true, but that's all it gets you. Like it points you in the right direction, but to go where you need to go, you also need advocacy. And at least for me, like at the School of Public Health at Harvard, there's a bright line in the sign in the sand between like science and advocacy. And frankly, I think you need both, right? Like you don't want to like pollute science with put, putting your thumb on the scale. You want to keep the science pure. But once you think that you're observing the truth, then you need to build a coalition, frame the message, organize. Um, it's not like in politics, it's the same thing. Like why go into politics if you don't have a platform? What's the point? And also we're like a week and a half away from a federal election cycle and nobody cares about your platform this far in, right? That's the truth. Like you've got to build a coalition, frame your message, convey it through trustworthy channels, all those things. Like you've got to do that work. Thank you very much. Ms. Aldridge? All right, let's get started with our questions from the audience. First question, based on your most recent data, how extensive do you think, do you believe it will reach? Do you think this will become a nationwide practice or will it go beyond our borders? Uh, the, the program that I, I showed, I'm, um, it was designed to become a global standard. It was inspired by uh, the surgical safety checklist, which is, you know, right before a pilot hits the throttle, they have to run a checklist. Today, um, just before a surgeon picks up a scalpel, they've got to go through a checklist. And this drops mortality in half for every surgery on every continent. And that checklist was the inspiration for this program. So I think it's going to go all the way. Um, and that's why, you know, there's no technology in it. It's meant to be something that can work in every setting. Um, all right, thank you. Our second question. Thank you, Dr. Shaw, for a powerful concept with what looks like a simple solution that improved and improved the lives of many people. Training programs have patients with no connection to the physician who delivers their baby. Have residency programs adopted your solution to the extent that it includes house staff? Yeah, it's not only that they've adopted it, but oftentimes the residents are the ones who drive it. Um, you know, because it's like the the ornery attendings that like don't want anything to do with it. They're like, I'm already a good communicator, you know. And actually, in in most settings in America, people not only don't know who's going to de deliver their baby, but <clears throat> the delivering provider isn't in house. Like they're they're in their clinic or they're at home sleeping overnight, and it's the residents who are doing all the work. So uh, we found that like the young people in the hospitals are the ones who are generally actually it's a belt it's it's like a bimodal distribution. It's like people who've done, they've seen a lot in their career, right? They were around in the 70s when the C-section rate was 5%. <laughs> they see the direction things are headed in and, and they, they're they ready to model change and bestow wisdom. And they're people at the beginning of their career that are really fired up. And there's a bunch of laggards in the middle that you've got to like bring along the way. But residents have been absolutely crucial and students. Dr. Shaw, thank you for your work. What can the average person do to help push us in the right direction? How can we help with making birthing experience equitable? I ask because I know minority women who are still having unfair birth experiences. I think we can do a couple things. In the next week and a half, you can vote. Elections matter. And, uh, women's health, reproductive health, and racial equity are all on the ballot. So average person, it's top of mind. Also, policies are blunt instruments. Uh, and if you want to make a change in your immediate community, um, I think honestly, in this particular case, it starts with having the tough conversations. I remember when it was edgy to use the word racism in a public setting. Uh, I think maybe it still is in some places, but I think 
you know, one of the things that's been really great about this movie, for instance, is like it's created a vehicle for having hard but necessary conversations about people's experiences. And it's like you don't you don't have to have all the answers. That's OK. I mean, these are like hard problems. But I think creating for a holding space, creating space for people like I imagine um, the people that you know that you're referencing to share what their experiences have been have been really powerful. For example, we just did an event uh, at a, me a medical center in New York yesterday uh, with the cast and crew of Aftershock. And everyone who's in the audience was a doctor or a nurse. And they, you know, they think that they've seen it all and they think they sort of understand what it's like. Um, and many of them were not people of color, right? It's like an academic medical center in New York. So um, it was powerful to hear that like, you know, the husband of somebody who lost his wife during childbirth was worried about his wife. Because the thing is, like, a young, healthy person is completely fine until they're not. Like, once their heart rate changes and stuff, like, it's, it's like, too late. But he was, he knew his wife, and he knew that she didn't look right. And he was advocating for her. But as a Black man, he didn't want to come across as angry and get thrown out. And that limited his ability to advocate for his wife. And he, he told that story, and it like it stopped everybody in the room in their tracks. Like, I think at the end of the day, day, like most human beings are decent, but we don't have the, the spaces to hear hear from each other. One, one second, please, before I already ask the next question. Um, um, Dr. Shaw, so that you will know, Lachlan is actually on as one of the attendees. You can't see him, but he can see you. So <laughs> I just want you to know that. That's great. Um, um, uh, uh, um, um, Ari, is there another question, Timothy? Yes, we have um, four more questions. Okay, a quick, okay, quick question and a follow up to the last question, Dr. Shaw. Um, now, um, to to uh, to stay away from the political side, you don't have to tell us who to vote for. But um, can you share <clears throat> um, what kind? Be, be more kind of clear, or candid about what kind of uh, for those looking for a platform to stand when they're voting in the next uh, 72 hours or so, uh, what are we looking for that would help this situ to move this goalpost or to move this needle forward? I think... Uh... I'm sorry, but like, it is impossible to take care of pregnant people and not encounter people who have pregnancies that are medically dangerous, that are psychologically excruciating or otherwise undesired. And um, there's a lot of complexity around the idea of abortion in some senses, but there really isn't in others. The Dobbs decision is going to make maternal mortality worse. There's data that indicates that it's going to get worse by about 20%, but not across the board. It's all going to get concentrated. The people who are going to be hurt the most are Black women in the South. Mm. It's as apolitical as I can make that. They will, you'll be helpful. Thank, thank about you. Life, so. life and death. And then Medicaid's on the belt. We should be oh. extending and expanding Medicaid. Thank you. That's very, very helpful. Thank you so much, sir. All right, Ms. Ms. Orange, continue, please. Do you believe African American pregnant mothers' past experiences with having their power taken away has affected their stance to decide their abortion rights? I don't know how to interpret that, but I really hope. I mean, I think that uh, I think that there's a lens on the history of America where, you know, we owe great debt of gratitude to Black women specifically for pushing forward progress. And I am very hopeful that as many will vote as possible. And I'll just leave it there. And not just vote. Like, let's get Stacey Abrams in seat and let's get some more representation while we're at it. Thank you so much, you be clear. 
Hi, Ms. Audrey, Orange. Hi, I'm a preventative medicine fellow at Meharry, currently working on secondary cardiometabolic screening and community engagement research here in Nashville. As a Latina physician, is it difficult to it is difficult to find Spanish translation and auxiliary staff with the technical language ability. How can Medicare and Medicaid, I believe she meant, help support precision referring and addressing health equity in hard to reach populations? Thank you for that question. I mean, I mean, I think it's like, I mean, I still have a clinic at BI um, in, in Boston, and uh, we have some technology that we use, but, you know, getting an interpreter when someone does not speak English as a first language, uh, it delays your clinic, even when you have access. It, like, throws a wrench in everything. Like, the workflows make no sense, and it's just very hard. Same time, it's like, you cannot take good care of people unless you're speaking their language. How can they possibly share with you? <laughs> um, in 2022, I think there's, like, no excuse for not being able to have that, but you need to use technology to do it. And so like, I mean, like, let's be honest, like in some ways, like healthcare, we use proton beams and stuff. Like we have technology, but we're still using fax machines and pagers. Like it really is time for a digital revolution in healthcare, whereby uh, there's no scenario where you can't connect to someone who can translate and speak your primary language. Um, I say that, and I also have tremendous empathy for the person who's in the position of not being able to access anybody for their patients or refer to refer them um, as a preventive medicine person to uh, you know specialists that can speak their language especially because like ha how many people in America now their primary language is Spanish it's like come on you know but th at the end of the day like we have to have a healthcare workforce that looks like the people they're serving This is our last question for today. Um, how will this concept translate to those who do? How will this concept? Okay, so how would this concept translate to those who uh, wish to have their babies in a traditional setting, i.e., the hospital? Are people who choose to have home births able to get access to this research as well? Are there platforms in place for people um, who have questions about this? and they're, are they able to find answers? Uh, yeah, I mean, so the, the program that I mentioned, um, it's all freely accessible uh, on the internet. It's called Team Birth. Um, if you Google it, you should be able to find it. I'm also easy to find and happy to connect. Um, uh, yes, uh, we think that it's a process that should be able to work in a variety of birth settings, but I think the deeper issue is that people often don't have a choice about the setting that they give birth in. 99% of American women give birth in hospitals surrounded by surgeons. Um, and, um, you know, we should be able to have a system where it's safe to have a baby at home or in a birthing center. And the way to do it is have coordination among the different settings so that if you need a high level of care, we can do that, as is the case in a lot of Western Europe. But, um, uh, well, regardless, um, big opportunity to think about how we can create options for people giving birth about the setting that they want to give birth in. And then we have a statement for you, Dr. Shaw. It's so refreshing to see that you are opening the eyes of the doctors graduating to do the right thing instead of the easy thing. Trustworthiness starts with being trustworthy as an individual. The, the paradigm of care has to change in order for black and brown people to accept. This has been the case since the slaves arrived on these shores. We need more doctors like you looking to concrete implementations of delivery of healthcare. Thank you for your presentation. And that'll conclude the Q and A part of this presentation. Thank you very much, Ms. Alridge. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Shaw, so much for being with us here today. Um, we really appreciate your work and your presence in the community, especially <clears throat> as a, as um, it's interesting, um, the, the passion with which you bring to this conversation. Um, 
that be to deal with uh, uh, black and brown women. And, uh, and I appreciate how readily you made yourself available to come and <clears throat> speak with us today um, from the very, um, from the very, very from the initial the initial reaching out by I think it was Nurse Macaro until you have just been so present. So we thank you so much. Um, before we close the session, we're at the time, but I would like to see Dr. Warren. Do you have anything to add to this particular conversation? I think um, the conversation was timely. Uh, it's all, and I was pleased to to separate infant mortality from maternal mortality. You know, it's it's almost like women are not a value unless they are connected to a child. And it's separated and it, it was very exciting. The other thing that I think is important is we continue to apologize for the relationship between politics and healthcare, politics and public health. It's impossible, they're one and the same. So we, ought to, we need to stop apologizing for what's real. Politics is simply who gets what, when, where, and how. And healthcare is fundamental to that. So let's talk about the, 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 the politics of it. Uh, and, and don't be afraid to talk about that because that's what's before us the next week or so, the politics of health, as well as the politics of life. Thank you very much, Dr. Warren.